Before we tell of how this Roman Empire which was built up in the two centuries BC, and which flourished in peace and security from the days of Augustus Caesar onward for two centuries, fell into disorder and was broken up, it may be as well to devote some attention to the life of the ordinary people throughout this great realm. Our history has come down now to within two thousand years of our own time, and the life of the civilized people, both under the peace of Rome and the peace of the Han dynasty, was beginning to resemble more and more clearly the life of their civilized successors today. In the Western world coin money was now in common use, outside the priestly world there were many people of independent means who were neither officials of the government nor priests, people traveled about more freely than they had ever done before, and there were high roads and inns for them. Compared with the past, with the time before 500 BC, life had become much more loose. Before that date civilized men had been bound to a district or country, had been bound to a tradition and lived within a very limited horizon, only the nomads traded and traveled. But neither the Roman peace nor the peace of the Han dynasty meant a uniform civilization over the large areas they controlled. There were very great local differences and great contrasts and inequalities of culture between one district and another, just as there are today under the British peace in India. The Roman garrisons and colonies were dotted here and there over this great space, worshipping Roman gods and speaking the Latin language, but where there had been towns and cities before the coming of the Romans, they went on, subordinated indeed but managing their own affairs, and, for a time at least, worshipping their own gods in their own fashion. Over Greece, Asia Minor, Egypt and the Hellenized East generally, the Latin language never prevailed. Greek ruled there invincibly. Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, was a Jew and a Roman citizen, but he spoke and wrote Greek and not Hebrew. Even at the court of the Parthian dynasty, which had overthrown the Greek Seleucids in Persia, and was quite outside the Roman imperial boundaries, Greek was the fashionable language. In some parts of Spain and in North Africa, the Carthaginian language also held on for a long time in spite of the destruction of Carthage. Such a town as Seville, which had been a prosperous city long before the Roman name had been heard of, kept its Semitic goddess and preserved its Semitic speech for generations, in spite of a colony of Roman veterans at Italica a few miles away. Septimius Severus, who was emperor from 193 to 211 AD, spoke Carthaginian as his mother speech. He learned Latin later as a foreign tongue, and it is recorded that his sister never learnt Latin and conducted her Roman household in the Punic language. A Gladiator, Contemporary Representation In such countries as Gaul and Britain and in provinces like Dacia, now roughly Romania, and Pannonia, Hungary south of the Danube, where there were no pre-existing great cities and temples and cultures, the Roman Empire did however Latinaize. It civilized these countries for the first time. It created cities and towns where Latin was from the first the dominant speech, and where Roman gods were served and Roman customs and fashions followed. The Romanian, Italian, French and Spanish languages, all variations and modifications of Latin, remain to remind us of this extension of Latin speech and customs. Northwest Africa also became at last largely Latin-speaking. Egypt, Greece, and the rest of the empire to the east were never Latinized. They remained Egyptian and Greek in culture and spirit. And even in Rome, among educated men, Greek was learnt as the language of a gentleman and Greek literature and learning were very, properly preferred to Latin. In this miscellaneous empire the ways of doing work and business were naturally also very miscellaneous. The chief industry of the settled world was still largely agriculture. We have told how in Italy the sturdy free farmers who were the backbone of the early Roman Republic were replaced by estates worked by slave labor after the Punic Wars. The Greek world had had very various methods of cultivation, from the Arcadian plan, wherein every free citizen toiled with his own hands, to Sparta, wherein it was a dishonor to work and where agricultural work was done by a special slave class, the Helots. But that was ancient history now and over most of the Hellenized world the estate system and slave gangs had spread. The agricultural slaves were captives who spoke many different languages so that they could not understand each other, or they were born slaves, they had no solidarity to resist oppression, no tradition of rights, no knowledge, for they could not read nor write. 
Although they came to form a majority of the country population they never made a successful insurrection. The insurrection of Spartacus in the first century BC was an insurrection of the special slaves who were trained for the gladiatorial combats. The agricultural workers in Italy in the latter days of the Republic and the early empire suffered frightful indignities, they would be chained at night to prevent escape or have half the head shaved to make it difficult. They had no wives of their own, they could be outraged, mutilated, and killed by their masters. A master could sell his slave to fight beasts in the arena. If a slave slew his master, all the slaves in his household and not merely the murderer were crucified. In some parts of Greece, in Athens notably, the lot of the slave was never quite so frightful as this, but it was still detestable. To such a population the barbarian invaders who presently broke through the defensive line of the legions came not as enemies but as liberators. Pompeii Pompeii Note the ruts in roadway worn by chariot wheels. The slave system had spread to most industries and to every sort of work that could be done by gangs. Mines and metallurgical operations, the rowing of galleys, roadmaking, and big building operations were all largely slave occupations. And almost all domestic service was performed by slaves. There were poor freemen and there were freedmen in the cities and upon the countryside, working for themselves or even working for wages. They were artisans, supervisors, and so forth, workers of a new money paid class working in competition with slave workers, but we do not know what proportion they made of the general population. It probably varied widely in different places and at different periods. And there were also many modifications of slavery, from the slavery that was chained at night and driven with whips to the farm or quarry, to the slave whose master found it advantageous to leave him to cultivate his patch or work his craft and own his wife like a free man, provided he paid in a satisfactory quittance to his owner. There were armed slaves. At the opening of the period of the Punic Wars, in 264 BC, the Etruscan sport of setting slaves to fight for their lives was revived in Rome. It grew rapidly fashionable, and soon every great Roman rich man kept a retinue of gladiators, who sometimes fought in the arena but whose real business it was to act as his bodyguard of bullies. And also there were learned slaves. The conquests of the later republic were among the highly civilized cities of Greece, North Africa and Asia Minor, and they brought in many highly educated captives. The tutor of a young Roman of good family was usually a slave. A rich man would have a Greek slave as librarian, and slave secretaries and learned men. He would keep his poet as he would keep a performing dog. In this atmosphere of slavery the traditions of modern literary criticism were evolved. The slaves still boast and quarrel in our reviews. There were enterprising people who bought intelligent boy slaves and had them educated for sale. Slaves were trained as book copyists, as jewelers, and for endless skilled callings. The Colosseum, Rome The Colosseum, Rome Photo, Underwood and Underwood Interior of the Colosseum at it appears T.O. Day Interior of the Colosseum at it appears T.O. Day but there were very considerable changes in the position of a slave during the 400 years between the opening days of conquest under the Republic of Rich Men and the days of disintegration that followed the Great Pestilence. In the 2nd century BC war captives were abundant, manners gross and brutal, the slave had no rights and there was scarcely an outrage the reader can imagine that was not practiced upon slaves in those days. But already in the first century AD there was a perceptible improvement in the attitude of the Roman civilization towards slavery. Captives were not so abundant for one thing, and slaves were dearer. And slave owners began to realize that the profit and comfort they got from their slaves increased with the self-respect of these unfortunates. But also the moral tone of the community was rising, and a sense of justice was becoming effective. The higher mentality of Greece was qualifying the old Roman harshness. Restrictions upon cruelty were made, a master might no longer sell his slave to fight beasts, 
A slave was given property rights in what was called his peculium, slaves were paid wages as an encouragement and stimulus, a form of slave marriage was recognized. Very many forms of agriculture do not lend themselves to gang working or require gang workers only at certain seasons. In regions where such conditions prevailed the slave presently became a serf, paying his owner part of his produce or working for him at certain seasons. When we begin to realize how essentially this great Latin and Greek-speaking Roman Empire of the first two centuries AD was a slave state and how small was the minority who had any pride or freedom in their lives, we lay our hands on the clues to its decay and collapse. There was little of what we should call family life, few homes of temperate living and active thought and study, schools and colleges were few and far between. The free will and the free mind were nowhere to be found. The great roads, the ruins of splendid buildings, the tradition of law and power it left for the astonishment of succeeding generations must not conceal from us that all its outer splendor was built upon thwarted wills, stifled intelligence, and crippled and perverted desires. And even the minority who lorded it over that white realm of subjugation and of restraint and forced labor were uneasy and unhappy in their souls, art and literature, science and philosophy, which are the fruits of free and happy minds, waned in that atmosphere. There was much copying and imitation, an abundance of artistic artificers, much slavish pedantry among the servile men of learning, but the whole Roman Empire in four centuries produced nothing to set beside the bold and noble intellectual activities of the comparatively little city of Athens during its one century of greatness. Athens decayed under the Roman scepter. The science of Alexandria decayed. The spirit of man, it seemed, was decaying in those days. 